my Govanen. Welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek. And if you watched my previous video published uh, at the beginning of 2019 about the adventures of Tom Bombadil, then you will know that I referenced a potential video that I had done covering Farmer Maggot. Hadn't actually done that yet. So in this video, I am rectifying that. I'm going to cover not only Farmer Maggot, but also basically all the differences or the major differences between the book and the movie, Peter Jackson's movies, when it comes to how Frodo ends up leaving the Shire. Because there's actually quite a lot of differences, not only in terms of what happens, but also the order in which things happen. So we're going to get into that. Also, if you watch my 2019 preview video where I talked about the ways I was going to be improving the channel, you will notice that in this video I have finally managed to incorporate clips from the movies to kind of help things out a little bit. So with that said, let's get started and take a look at the differences between the book and the movie from basically the end of Gandalf and Frodo's conversation about the ring to the point where Frodo leaves the Shire. Oh, and by the way, after I finish this, I don't know how many of you usually watch the end part of my videos after I finish the substance, but do stick around this time in case you normally don't, because I do have a little bit of an announcement to make at the end of this video. So stick around after I finish the substance for that. So to begin this story, we have to go back to the end of the chapter in the book titled The Shadows of the Past, and that's where Gandalf tells Frodo about the ring. Now, what we get in the movie is basically an abbreviated version, and it's not substantially different, except we get a lot of the information in the in the book, in the prologue of the movie. So, I mean, it's just kind of it's about when, when the issue is addressed, because in the movie they're trying to give you some information up front. But the significant thing I want to point out here is the difference between what happens at the end of that conversation in the book and in the movie. So let's see what it looks like in the movie. What must I do? You must leave, and leave quickly. I can cut across country easily enough. My dear Frodo, hobbits really are amazing creatures. Of course, I kind of cut short some of what happens in that little sequence. It shows Frodo packing and things. But the main point here is, in the movie, Gandalf is the one who tells Frodo what he should do. And then at the end of all that... Frodo basically tells him, you know, I can cut across country, and that's when Gandalf says, Hobbits are amazing creatures. In the book, it's a lot different, and this is one area in which a lot of people, including myself, uh, criticize Peter Jackson, because they really make Frodo a lot more of a passive player in all of this stuff. In the book, Gandalf basically asks Frodo, what are you going to do? Frodo actually kind of sits there thinking for a long while, being kind of irresolute about what he actually does want to do. And then Gandalf kind of interrupts and says, well, have you actually decided what you're going to do? And Frodo's like, no, well, yes. Uh, I suppose I'll have to take the ring out of the Shire uh, and keep it safe. And then that's when Gandalf in the book says, hobbits are amazing creatures, which makes a lot more sense because at that point, Gandalf is actually remarking on the fact that hobbits to all appearances are the last race on middle earth that you would expect to have any kind of bravery sense of adventure anything like that and yet every now and then you get somebody like frodo who admittedly has some took and brandy buck in his heritage who will go out and really do something amazing not necessarily amazing in the grand scheme of things but at least amazing from the perspective of that's what a hobbit would do so in the movie, it's not really clear what exactly Gandalf is remarking on. In the book, it's quite obvious. He's remarking on the fact that Frodo is doing something that you would never expect a hobbit to do. So that's one major difference. Then, of course, we get Sam's interruption. Confound it all, Samwise Gamgee! Have you been eavesdropping? There isn't really a whole lot of difference here between the movie and the book. The main difference is in the book, this conversation actually takes place in the morning. Gandalf arrives at night, or at least late in the day, and basically tells Frodo, I'm not going to tell you all the creepy stuff at night. That's really a little bit too much. They wait till the next morning, and that's when Gandalf has the conversation with Frodo. And so it really does make sense for Sam to be gardening. In fact, they hear the sounds of Sam doing his gardening 
from throughout the conversation, and it's only at the end when it's kind of quiet that Gandalf goes over to the window and grabs him. Uh, there really isn't a whole lot of difference other than that, uh, but it is worth noting, I think, that in the in the book, it does actually make sense for Sam to be there. Why he's there in the movie is not exactly clear. So, anyway, that's that's just something I wanted to point out. And now we start to get to really big differences in terms of how things get moving. Come along, Samwise. Keep up. The impression we get here is that Frodo and Sam are basically setting out the very next morning, which might have been really 20 minutes later. I mean, it's not really clear how long Gandalf and Frodo were up after Gandalf got there, which was clearly already at nighttime. So, you know, Frodo had clearly already packed, so presumably they were up all night, and now Frodo and Sam are getting ready to go, and Gandalf basically sends them on their way. In the book, there is a lot of difference all packed into this one little segment. And it gets down to the fact that when Gandalf, uh, well, when Frodo decides that he's going to leave the Shire, Gandalf at one point kind of prods him, what are you planning to do? And Frodo's like, well, do I need to leave immediately? And he's like, no, you don't want to leave in a rush, but you do want to have a plan and you need to make it happen soon. And he basically kind of gives him a deadline well, he doesn't give him a deadline. Frodo says, well, I'll leave on Bilbo's birthday. And Gandalf says, certainly no later than that, but that'll work. Frodo's plan, basically, is to quietly sell Bag End and pretend he's moving back to Buckland, which is where he grew up because his mother was a Brandy Buck. And that's how he knows Mary Brandy Buck and Peregrine Took and all these other, you know, a lot of different people. Also in the book, we get a reference to a character that we don't really see in the movie except for one very brief reference and that's Fatty Bulger or Fredegar Bulger and in the book his role is basically to help Mary move a lot of the furniture bag in that Frodo is going to keep to the house that he buys in Crick Hollow in Buckland which is part of the ruse of him moving there which is basically just a way of him moving further east away from the center of attention where he will then kind of quietly slip off and do it without anybody really noticing what's going on. While Mary Brandybuck and per and uh, Fredegar Bolger are handling things at Crick Hollow, Sam and Frodo and Pippin are actually finishing up the last touches at uh, the Shire. Now, in the meantime, Gandalf had stayed for, uh, I think, a couple of weeks or something like that, but eventually left saying he needed to go gather some news. He was going to be gone a short while, hopefully, and then would be back. Uh, and he basically said, but if I'm not back before, you know, you leave, then meet me at the Prancing Pony Inn at Bree. So that's where that part comes in. It didn't come in at the initial conversation like it does in the movie, which I kind of skipped that part. But So Gandalf is gone. Frodo, Sam, and Pippin are basically trying to come up with their, you know, their their plan to get going. On Frodo's birthday, which is, of course, Bilbo's birthday as well, they decide to have one quiet little birthday party in honor of Bilbo and Frodo. Frodo has sold the the key, the bag in to the Sackfield Bagginses, but they don't get the keys till midnight. He plans to give the keys to uh, Gaffer Gamgee, who was Sam's father and the, uh, Bilbo's gardener before Sam took over the job. And he's going to give him the keys to hold until the Sackville Bagginses have a right to pick them up. But he and Pippin and Sam are going to take off, you know, in the evening, basically get some night walking done, camp out, and then continue on to Crick Hollow. Well, here's where some interesting things start to happen. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff packed into this one little scene that they skip. Sam, of course, goes to give the keys uh, to Gaffer, and Frodo steps out, and he... At, he overhears a conversation between Gaffer Gamgee and someone else. He can't tell what the other person is saying, but he doesn't like the voice, and neither apparently does Gaffer Gamgee, and he overhears somebody asking about Baggins. Frodo is kind of putting this down to people just being overly inquisitive in the Shire, uh, but this becomes important later because Sam will eventually tell Frodo about this at a later point in the story. At any rate, Frodo just kind of avoids it to make sure he's not seen by anybody. Pippin, Frodo, and Sam then do set out, 
and basically walk for a while and then eventually camp out before the night is too terribly old and get some sleep before the next morning. Here's where side-by-side -side comparisons start to break down because now the order of events start to change as well as the substance of what happens. So we get, and I'm about to show a few clips here, basically we get a walking montage and a couple of other things, but let me just show you a few clips and then kind of come back and clean up what happens compared to the book. Wood elves. They're going to the harbor beyond the White Towers. To the Grey Havens. They're leaving Middle Earth. Never to return. I don't know why. It makes me sad. I'm never gonna be able to sleep out here. Me neither, Sam. So here we get a nice obligatory montage. We get Frodo and Sam's near encounter with some wood elves, which I'll come back to later because they don't encounter the elves yet. They encounter them much later and they're not wood elves. They're actually high elves who just happen to be living in the woods. Um, and we get our first appearance of a black rider, but we don't actually have an encounter with the black rider yet which is also slightly wrong because that also comes out of order. Now let's take a look at just a couple more quick clips before I move on. Sam, we're still in the Shire. What could possibly happen? No. You've been in the Farmer Maggot's crop! That was just a detour. A shortcut. A shortcut to what? The mushrooms! So here we get uh, Mary and Pippin joining the fun, whereas I mentioned before, in the book, Mary doesn't show up until much later because he's gone on ahead to Crick Hollow. Pippin has been with them the entire time. So, also the, the other thing that we get here is the one very brief and not terribly pleasant uh, reference that we get to Farmer Maggot. And we get the impression that Mary and Pippin are just kind of scoundrels who steal stuff from Farmer Maggot's fields on a regular basis. And... Well, and then they all run away and fall into a pile of, almost fall into a pile of, well, what looks like some kind of dung. And then they reference a shortcut to, what? Mushrooms. This is a clever throwback to the movie, I mean the book rather, because in the book, the encounter with Farmer Maggot, which is much more extended, occurs in the chapter, Shortcut to Mushrooms. It's also a bit of a throwback because... Well, I'll get to that later, but it has to do with Frodo, Mushrooms, and Farmer Maggot. So just remember that, file that away for a little bit until we come back to it. Uh, but then we finally get our first real encounter with the Black Rider in this scene. Get off the road! Quick! Now we're almost to the end of Frodo's trip out of the Shire at this point in the movie, but in the book, the first encounter with a Ringwraith actually comes quite early. The second day of their trip, which is kind of the first full day because they set out the night before, uh, Frodo, Pippin, and Sam are walking along the road when they hear hoofs. Now, Frodo basically kind of says, I don't want to be seen on the road. And he puts it off as just wanting to be not seen by anybody who's trying to be too inquisitive, but he also kind of has like a, a premonition that something's not really right and has a bad feeling about it. So Sam and Pippin go off, well, they have a short conversation beforehand where they kind of decide, well, you know, what if it's Gandalf? And Frodo says, then we'll just surprise him and pay him back for being late. Sam and Pippin run off. Frodo stays on the road till almost the last second because he has this weird curiosity but he finally dives into some tall grass right next to a tree that's next to the road. And then he kind of peeks over the, the root of the tree, which 
kind of fits in with, you know, what we see in the movie because they are under a root. Although Peter Jackson gets that more from Ralph Bakshi's uh, animated movie, which I will do a full review on soonish. I've actually finished watching that now. Um, but he's looking over this tree root and he sees this black rider come up. Now, in this encounter in the book, the rider does not dismount. He just kind of sits crouched on the saddle and looks one way and the other. Frodo has this really powerful urge to put on the ring and as he's about to, you know, reach for it and really put it on, the rider decides to move on. We don't know why, but he does. Now, Pippin and Sam come up and they're all like, that was kind of weird. And F Frodo mentions the fact that the Black Rider was sniffing and he thinks for him, which he doesn't really know why he thinks that, but nevertheless, he does. Um, and so that, that also kind of matches with what Peter Jackson has in his movie because the Black Rider is sniffing. That's where he gets that. So that's our first uh, encounter with the Black Rider. But then a lot more stuff happens before we really leave the Shire. So let's cover a lot of that material now. As they're discussing this first encounter with the Black Rider, Frodo says, I don't know where he came from. And Sam pipes up and says, I do, sort of. Uh, and Frodo's like, what? So Sam basically mm. says that when he went to meet Gaffer Gamgee and give him the key to Bag End, Gaffer told him about this encounter that he had with a black rider who wasn't terribly pleasant. And Frodo realizes that it's probably the same person who was asking after him. And now he's really starting to worry. At any rate, to keep safe, they decide to stay off the road a bit to make sure that they don't get caught by surprise by any other riders that come along. And they stay off the road for quite a while, but eventually they have to get back on it, basically to make speed and sometimes because their country is rough. At the point where they're back on the road, they hear hoofs again. And so Frodo's like, okay, get off the road again, let's go. Um, and this time they all kind of go off together, but Frodo doesn't go quite as far because he wants to see. And the other two basically say, well, don't forget about the sniffing. Uh, so Frodo is kind of looking. And at this point, it's dark. It's actually nighttime, so it's a little bit harder to see, but he can see the, the road, and he sees a shadow that looks like a man leading a horse, so the rider is actually already dismounted. And then he sees what he thinks is the rider kind of stooping where they left the road, sniffing again, and then he starts to move off the road in their direction. And then Frodo gets an even stronger urge to put on the ring, and he almost does it when suddenly they hear some sound and the Black Rider moves off. And as the Black Rider goes away and they start to listen, they realize that the sound, or what scared the Black Rider off, was actually elves singing. And Sam, who of course really wants to meet some elves, basically says, can we go meet them? And Frodo says, well, they're actually heading our way. All we have to do is wait. And this is where we finally get an encounter with elves, not way before the Black Rider. So, I mean, there's one big swap in terms of the ordering of events and this time they actually do wait for the elves to come to them and they actually fall in with the group now this is an interesting little episode because they actually talk to the elves and in particular uh, the leader of the elves is gildor in glorian and he basically tells them we are high elves of the house of finrod uh, which if you know your silmarillion then you'll know what that means if you don't know what that means that's fine it's not really that important the main thing is these are elves who had been in Valinor and left to come back in the First Age. And so they've actually, you know, they're better in a lot of ways than the elves who never left Middle-earth. So anyway, they start having conversations. Uh, eventually the topic of Black Riders comes up and the elves are like, why are you asking us about Black Riders? Um, and they kind of explain the encounters that they've had. And... They basically, to cut a long story short, because there's a lot of conversation, Gildor basically ends up telling him, G did Gandalf tell you what these things are? And Frodo said, he didn't tell me anything about these guys. And Gildor says, well, then I hate to tell you what it is because I don't want to scare you off your journey. So, uh, And he also basically says, I can't really give you much advice because I don't know where you're going or why. And I can't tell you to wait for Gandalf or if you should go on because there's risks either way. So, um, and incidentally, by this point, the elves have taken them to a, a dwelling that they have in the woods, which is kind of like almost a natural hall created by the branches of trees. 
and Pippin fell asleep rather quickly. Sam tried to stay awake at Frodo's feet, but eventually passed out as well. But at any rate, at the end of all this, Gildor kind of gives Frodo one piece of his advice, which is don't meddle in the affairs of wizards, for they are subtle and quick to anger. Uh, and then Frodo retorts, it is also said that you should not go to the elves for advice because they will tell you both yes and no, basically referring to the fact that Gildor basically said, you know, the choice is yours, go or stay, I can't really advise you. And Gildor points out rather wisely that the elves never tend to give advice because it's such a dangerous gift to give. And basically he says, you know, we'll I'll send messages to who I can. I name you elf friend. I will, you know, make sure that anybody who you meet who is friends with us will will help you along your way. But that's, you know, if you're if you can't tell me what your errand is or where you're going or why, then I can't really tell you what to do. Um but anyway, they kind of leave the conversation there and let Frodo go to sleep. And then the next morning, things start to pick up and become interesting again. The next morning, the hobbits wake to find that the elves have gone, but they've left them some supplies. Frodo, in an attempt to hopefully shorten the journey and also to avoid the Black Riders, says, well, we're going to take a shortcut across the wild country. Pippin objects, shortcuts make for long delays. And he also mentions the fact that he was hoping to pass by the Golden Perch Inn, which apparently has the best ale in those parts. Sam, of course, is rather sad about the prospect of missing out on that, uh, but at any rate, Frodo insists and basically says, we're going to do this because don't really want to run into the Black Riders again. They start to head toward the, um, the wild country as opposed to the roads. They reach a point where there's a bit of a tough spot, and Pippin says, well, like I said, well, he actually says first check, but you can basically read into that, told you so. And Frodo says, uh, yeah, maybe. And then they look back, and where they had camped the night before, they see a black rider. And so they're all like, okay, forget going back. We're going through the wild country. So sure enough, they do take quite a long time getting back to the road. Uh, they don't really do very well in the woods. They apparently lose their way. Uh, it gets rainy at one point. Eventually, they finally come back to the road. And Pippin says, well, I know where we're at. We're near Farmer Maggot's land. And Frodo says, oh, one thing after another. And Pippin and Sam are like, well, what? what's wrong? Uh, and Frodo basically says, I am terrified of Farmer Maggot and his dogs. Because when I was a kid, I used to steal mushrooms off his land. And the last time he caught me, he beat me. And he said that if he ever caught me doing that again, he would feed me to his dogs. And Pippin basically says, ah, don't worry about it. He's a friend of mine. I know him. And he's not going to do that. So anyway, they go up. They realize that they've kind of cut through Farmer Maggot's field. So they actually were trespassing. But they decide to go by road to the gate so as to kind of rectify that situation. Uh, while they're headed in that direction, sure enough, they hear dogs. And then Farmer Maggot himself comes up. The dogs are kind of, you know, staring him down and the hobbits aren't moving. When Farmer Maggot comes up, Pippin basically walks forward and says, Hello, you're, you know, and he, they know each other. And Pippin introduces Sam and Frodo. And at the name of Frodo Baggins, Farmer Maggot kind of perks up his ears and say, Oh, we have to have a talk. And Frodo is wondering, of course, what about? <laughs> at any rate, he takes them to his farmhouse where he has a wife and many children. Uh, they eat a rather nice dinner, uh, especially compared to what Frodo and company have been eating since they've been, you know, out, out in the country and not really at home to prepare a regular meal. Farmer Maggot, after everybody else leaves, tells the hobbits that, well, I had a black rider come up and ask about Baggins earlier today. And he said his dogs were actually cowering away from him, wouldn't, wouldn't really go near him. But he basically stood up to the Black Rider and said, You've not, I'm not telling you anything. You ain't got no business. And the Black Rider says, Well, I'll come back with gold if you'll give me information. He says, Oh, no, you won't. And then he tries to call his dogs on him, but the Black Rider just rides off. Frodo at this point is really terrified because he realizes these Black Riders are really hounding him. Farmer Maggot kind of perceives that Frodo is really troubled. 
and he says, I can see that you're in sort some sort of trouble, and I suspect it has something to do with Bilbo's adventures and probably that treasure he brought back. Frodo's, at this point, thinking, you're guessing a little bit too close to the mark. I wish you'd stop talking. <laughs> um, but at any rate, uh, Frodo kind of begs off and says, I don't know exactly what they're after, uh, but I need help. And Farmer Maggot basically agrees to take uh, him and Pippin and Sam in his cart all the way to Buckleberry Ferry, which is where they're supposed to meet Mary on that day, in fact. Uh, so the hobbits are, of course, very relieved at this. That'll help out because they can get in the back of his cart, cover up. Nobody will know they're there, and nobody would suspect anything. Plus, it'll be faster because they'll be pulled by a horse instead of having to walk the whole way. So it'll be kind of nice. So they set out, it's getting dark, uh, and the fog rolls in, they finally move up to getting close to the Buckleberry Ferry, and then they hear something up ahead, it sounds like hoofs. Of course, the hobbits are all rather terrified. They had actually all started to get out before they heard the hoofs, and then they're like, wait, get back in. Farmer Maggot challenges whoever it is, he can't see them because of the heavy fog, uh, and you know, takes a pretty high-handed tone, considering he's the one that's approaching the ferry, which he doesn't really have any right to. Um, but then they hear a voice out of the fog saying, it's, what are you, you know, what are you talking about? It's me, Mary. And they're all like, oh, phew, it's Master Mary. Uh, and then they get out, exchange words. Before Farmer Maggot heads back to his home, he gives Frodo a basket and says it's compliments of Mrs. Maggot. So, uh, he goes back home, and then the hobbits prepare to cross the ferry, and as they're watching Farmer Maggot uh, roll away in his cart, Frodo laughs, and he uncovers the basket, because what he smelled in the basket was mushrooms. So, it turned out Farmer Maggot, of course, knew the whole time who Frodo was, but he wasn't going to make a big deal of it, because he never really meant the threat in the first place. So... That's how they get to Buckleberry Ferry in the book. Now let's take a look at how that works out in the movie, which you probably already know, and I'm doing it too late, but let's watch the clip anyway. I have to leave the Shire. Sam and I must get debris. Right. Buckleberry Ferry, follow me. To the nearest crossing. Brandywine Bridge. 20 miles. So here we see that right after, uh, well, I mean, it's kind of the night of the first encounter with the, the Black Rider. They've been apparently running all day after that. And they run into the Black Rider again and they run for the ferry as fast as they can. Frodo barely makes it. The rider stops because he can't get in the water with the horse and turns around. There are a few more riders that go with him. Frodo asks Mary, where's the nearest crossing? Mary says, Brandywine Bridge, 20 miles. And then, basically, they cut to Bree. So, I mean, you're already, they're already out of the Shire. In the book, a lot of different things happen between those two events, obviously. I've already done videos on the Old Forest, Tom Bombadil, and the Barrow Downs. There is also another chapter called A Conspiracy Unmasked in which the hobbits make it to the house in Crick Hollow where Fredegar Bol uh, Bolger is waiting for them and they kind of talk about what's going to happen. Frodo finds out that they already know what he's doing uh, because Mary had seen Bilbo with the ring many years before and Frodo tries to tell them all not to go with him because it's going to be too dangerous, but one of the hobbits, is with either Pippin or Sam, because it had to have been somebody with him with the elves, says, don't forget what Gildor says, take someone with you as you can trust. And <laughs> Frodo says, of course, I don't know if I can trust any of you since you've all been spying on me. Uh, and of course, it also gets revealed at this point that Sam has been spying on behalf of Merry and Pippin for a while, because they've been quite apart from the ring, they've been expecting him to go off and follow Bilbo for a while because he had been getting obviously restless. Uh, so anyway, they spend the night in the house in Crick Hollow, and the next morning they go through the old forest, which is partially Mary's idea, partially Frodo's in the sense that he agrees with it because it's he wants, again, to stay off the road, keep undercover, 
avoid any possible encounters with black riders. So that's that's how all that works out in the book. There's a whole chapter for the conspiracy unmasked, and I might do a, eventually a video just on that. But for now, I just wanted to cover the basics to give you an idea, plus to connect this to the videos I've done on the old forest and the other stuff that follows. So you can go check those out. I will link to those in the description. Uh, that that pretty much covers the differences. I say that like it was really short. Uh, it really wasn't. There's a lot of material here. It's really interesting because you see so many adventures happen just in the... Well, I mean, in the book, it actually takes up two full chapters and then a little bit extra compared, you know, with what I've added, plus the third chapter of The Conspiracy Unmasked. There's a lot of material that happens in between Frodo deciding to leave the Shire and actually stepping out of the Shire. Uh, whereas in the movie, it's pretty quick. I mean, the entire thing kind of spans 10 to 15 minutes, and it's mostly walking montage and running from black riders. That's, that's mostly it. Um, so there's a lot that goes on. You could see the hobbits starting to have adventures, you know, before they ever leave the Shire, and it's and it's a little bit prolonged, but it's also really neat because you get to meet the elves and all this fun stuff happens. So the elves don't, you know, Sam doesn't meet the elves in Rivendell. He actually meets elves in the Shire. Uh, but anyway, before I go off too much on a tangent, that pretty much wraps that up. Now to get to the announcement I mentioned earlier. Okay, so the announcement I had in mind was I had a viewer email me recently and ask, do I have a Patreon account? Because he would like to donate. The answer was no, I didn't. But since he asked, what does one do when one asks, when somebody asks if you have a Patreon account? You go, well, I'll get right on that. So I actually am on Patreon now if anybody is interested. Um, I'll have the link to my page below. Uh, I'm still kind of working on figuring out what I want the tiers to be and how all that will work out. If any of you have suggestions for what kind of benefits you'd like to get um, for different levels of donations, then please mention that in the comments. I am totally open to any and all ideas, pretty much. So this is a new thing for me. I never really would have started the Patreon page on my own, but since somebody asked, I'm not going to turn it down. Uh... So anyway, I'll have a Patreon link below. Also, of course, as usual, you can, uh, if you enjoy the video, then please do give it a like, share it around. It helps a lot. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do that at J-R-R-T Lore. And you can subscribe to the channel by clicking this button, and you can find some of my previous videos here. And until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek signing out for the Tolkien Lore channel. Namariye. No